You, sir, are one question away from today's big jackpot. All you have to do is answer this correctly and you are walking home with the prize. Are you ready? Hit me. In 2023, there was a cinematic double feature. Okay. This double feature included a Warner Brothers movie adaptation of a popular brand by a beloved filmmaker. Got it. And a blockbuster drama focusing on a man grappling with the fallout of the Second World War. I so got this. What is the name of this double feature? Barbenheimer. <sighs> I'm so sorry, but the answer we're looking for is... After the end of the Second World War, failed kamikaze pilot Willy Wonka arrives in the big city to pursue his dreams. But he has to face down a giant monster, the evil chocolate cartel. They have terrible powers such as money and bribery. Not to mention he is haunted by the ghosts of his past, his failures lingering in nightmares that he cannot escape. Can his war truly come to an end? Can anyone's war truly come to an end? Don't miss this high stakes epic thriller catching the world by storm. The, I feel like that was a good little summary of this movie, don't you think? It's highly accurate. So, it is finally upon us, the wonkening. It's been wonked. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, I mean, like, I've known that I, we, neither of us were really looking forward to this movie. It was like, can I get the obvious part of the way? This movie didn't really need to exist. It seems Not like really. a terrible, <laughs> it seems like a really bad idea to give Willy Wonka a character shrouded in mystery. That's like kind of his deal. It doesn't make sense to really give him a backstory. And I went in, I'll admit, I was biased against this movie. I went in, and honestly, I have to say, I was ultimately kind of charmed over by it. It's like, I was like, okay, this idea still seems really silly, but if it could at least be a good version of this mm -hmm. mandate, then I could kind of warm up to it. Sure. Now... Right. Your opinion of it was... Oh, I fucking hated this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was, it's, it was maybe the unexpectedly the biggest roller coaster because, like, I hear about it and I'm like, well, that sounds stupid, but very on brand for the studio system these days. And then trailer comes out, pretty much confirms my you know, beliefs and like, well, that looks like straight trash. And then like the reviews are dropping and it's like, got really a positive reception. Like, okay, well maybe the editor for the trailer sucked or something. And then I sat down to the theater and it came on and the music swells and I'm like, Oh fuck. And then it's just kind of like, I allowed, tried to allow myself to like remain positive And I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> For, from what I understand, there is um, a big, like, a new fancy theater just opened up where you are, right? And this was, like, the the debut movie of that screen. Yeah, so Sif Cinema owes me a personal apology because they recently, we have one of, um, you know, like, the Cinerama format of, it's, like, a, this huge, like, curved screen. Um, basically, Seattle has, like, one of, I think, two or three, like, working Cineramas and then SIF, the big independent kind of theater company here, required it. And they were going to have this big grand opening. I was so excited that they announced that Wonka is the first movie they were going to show there. So I cried into my half chocolate, half normal popcorn and sat in the most comfortable seat I have in a long time. At least you got to watch it in comfort. Yeah, it was <laughs> consoling me. So... But I think this is going to make for a very interesting discussion then. Um, so, yeah. Because here's, here's the thing. While overall I'll say that I enjoyed it, it does have a lot of stuff that kind of holds it back from me truly loving it. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth. Um, you know, obviously, spoilers for everyone. Got that out of the way. Okay. So. Kind of start with the 
I, I kind of organize this into kind of like a good bad sandwich. Mm -hmm. I like my own thoughts. And then you can also, you know, you jump in here and just, you know, Keep counterpoint. <laughs> counterpoint, you know, with your own thoughts and everything. Um, like the first kind of, uh, you know, what I'll say is that I, again, mandate of young Willy Wonka prequel movie. We didn't really need to see it, but I feel like the the angle they go for is that the, the core of the story overall isn't a terrible idea to do this mandate. It's like he's stuck in this dead end job, trapped in debt, hashtag relatable. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, but he has a dream to make chocolate like his mother did. But the big, bad, evil chocolate cartel is trying to keep down the little guy. And he, he just wants to make delicious chocolate and sell it for reasonable prices. Oh, it's it's a little twee. Yes, it is. But it's not the like the worst direction to take this concept on. Like you could have done like a solo the Star Wars story kind of a thing, which they kind of do a little bit here. We'll get to that later. But someone gives him his top hat. Yeah, it's like it's like here's where you get the top hat. Here's where you get the purple coat. Like they didn't do that, which thank God. <laughs> yeah, so it's like like eighty percent of this movie. I feel like the core of the story is at least viable. And I think that was kind of where a, a, a facet of where it fell short for me is like I I do agree that like on paper this seems one viable. It's an it's a, like a semi like it's an interesting way i guess you could go about telling the story it's like maybe not totally expected and i think more importantly it does feel in beats very kind of rolled doll like we'll get into specific elements of it but like the air the kind of specific whimsy of it feels dolly in and then kind of like the some of the characters we'll be meeting you know like your your policeman the corrupt priest those feel very much like someone that he would write for which is good but my issue was it was just then there's this essential nastiness to roll doll like take it or like for good or ill and yeah. this felt like a, a very like kind of disingenuous and like deboned version of that and it's like okay if you're gonna pretend that you're roll doll actually do it and warts and all and don't give me this sort of like bodlerized version in a way yeah, and I'll, I'll say I totally see that as well because you look at some of the stuff he's like he where he wrote directly for the screen. Um, like, do you ever see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Yeah, yeah. It's like there's that that half of, like half of the movie is like random. I forget like the first half uh, of the movie. Wait, did it, he, I don't? Are you saying he screen wrote that? I think so. No, I think I think Ian Fleming screen wrote that, and then. Roald Dahl wrote a James Bond script, which I don't remember which one. They, like, flopped. No, no, I think Ian Fleming and Roald Dahl might have done that, actually. Okay, let me let me check here. Gotta go. Yeah, um, oh. Okay, so Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a book that was written by Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming. And then screenplay the screenplay for the movie okay. and Ken Hughes, yes. Uh, we're both right. Haha. Yay, everyone wins. Anyway. But like, like, yeah, so in the latter half of that movie, you have this character that comes in that's like the child catcher. <laughs> She's just like the... And it's, like you said, like he, again, it's like kind of like this whimsical kind of uh, person, but also like horribly nasty. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, as close um, as we get to it is the, like, Olivia Coleman character, and she's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's kind of like, like, her and, like, her business partner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's like, that's the kind of thing that, like, you, you kind of need, like, a little bit more of, um, because that, that's, you know, again, like, trying to measure this movie, like, as its own thing, you know, like, like that's one way to do it, and when it does that, it's like... It does all right, but mm -hmm. you also compare it to the book. You compare it to the other adaptations out there, and definitely there is. This feels like a more Paul King story than a Roald Dahl story. 
Yeah, in which case, just like... Make up an original Chocolatier story, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Like, uh, honestly, yes. Like, I feel like that legitimately would have been better. Because that actually kind of goes into... That dovetails into my next point, where... I feel like the movie is strongest when it's trying to do its own thing, but for about, like... Whenever it tries to be like, oh, we're going to call back to the 1971 version, then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, this is a studio product. <laughs> yeah, like, from the first... Like, even before there's images, you get that, like, opening little passage. Yeah. They they really like that one song, Pure Imagination. It's like... Oh, they loved it. Yeah. It's... Is that the only song they use, actually? <laughs> maybe... Maybe there was a, a rendition of, like, Cheer Up Charlie in there and we just never recognized it because nobody stays awake for that song. I mean, if I'm honest, all the other songs, I mean, I guess the Oompa Loompa song notwithstanding, are pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I mean, it's not the worst musical movie I've seen this past month. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. It's like, they got the right number of syllables, they moved the plot forward. <laughs> That's the level I'm at with this. <laughs> yeah. I actually have, like, a little thing here where, like, you can really dig into the songs because you're you're the musical one between the two oh, of God. us. Yeah, I, I, the, I think the songs were a key driver in me, like really despising aspects of this film. Like it's, I like movie musicals, but I think we're like at the we've finally finished beating a dead horse with like modern musicals, and I think a big aspect for me is that they c insist on casting non-singing actors for like these lead roles because you know timothy chalamet is like a hugely bankable name he's like getting towards like chris pratt here of like oversaturation or whatever um and i think there's like a video of him rapping or something when he was back in high school but he can't fucking sing like all of these like it, it's maybe not quite as bad as like emma watson and beauty the beast but oh, dear. I was talking with the friend that I like dragged, like kidnapped and dragged to the screening afterwards. And you're trying to like parse. He's also a big like musical guy. Um, and we we're trying to like articulate like what about it is. I think one, like he's so aggressively like forward in the mix. Like there's one song like there, we're jumping all over obviously, but like, you know, when they're pulling off that heist and he's like that kind of big, I don't know what, like learner and low number or something, but um he's so loud sometimes that i like had to like lean back in my chair and like protect myself but like it it it's like if do you know you know the band um owl city is that what they're called they did the I... fireflies like it's like oh, basically like, like would you i like to make eyes? myself believe yes that yes <laughs> Yeah, that one. It's like bargain bin postal service or something. It, it that is what modern musicals sound like. It's like this very flat production. This person with like no vibrato or any other sort of choices like that, just like pushed and compressed, and it just is this like eh, like this nasally wall of sound that I I can't do. And like it seems like he tried, and it's maybe not the worst I've heard, but it's just it's it's so bad and it, the songs were boring and I'm just rambling at this point but like it it really shouldn't have been a musical and they really tried to hide that but oh the, boy there's entire like headlines I've seen about like why do movie studios try to avoid advertising musicals yeah. mm -hmm. I just think that's such a funny way to approach it. It's like, okay, guys, we're going to make this movie a musical, but we can't let people know that it's a musical until after they have bought their tickets. Well, it's just like, and, and just like, if you're going to make a musical, that's great. That's fun. You know, every freaking Disney movie, like from the Renaissance and earlier, used like a different person to sing all the songs. Even something like the original West Side Story, I'm fairly positive, like Tony and Maria have like singing doubles. It's just like, just do that. If you can't hire someone that can sing, don't make somebody not sing and then try to like auto tune it to hell and back. Tom Hooper would like to have words with you. 
he believes in getting the full authentic performance and he, he sure he's showed like, us if someone cast. doesn't have snot running down their nose at some point in the movie it's not a good musical <laughs> so cats is a very good movie if you have a special gummy before watching it <laughs> I can definitely say it was a cinematic experience unlike anything I've ever it's had before. seared into my so. brain. <laughs> um, what were, what were we talking about? Oh yeah. I don't so, even know. Wonka. Oh yeah, we're talking about Wonka. Um, Wonka. Do you want to talk about cats? <laughs> um, so many different cats. Um, but anyway, yeah, so... Yeah, so kind of like coming back to the idea of like, you know, it does, you know, I feel like it does all right when it's doing its own thing, but it's when it does those callbacks that it just feels distracting. Like the part, so Wonka has this friend named Noodle. Again, that's like, again, it feels like a very Paul King kind of name for a character. Like, oh, little Noodle. It's like... Mm -hmm. I feel like if, you know, a role doll name would be like Flapjack. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so she she is an orphan who has been trapped by Olivia Coleman. Um, and she's talking about like, oh, she hopes and dreams to one day find her family in a house made of books. And as she's saying this, they start playing pure imagination in the background. And it's so distracting. <laughs> It is so distracting. <laughs> you don't like, like, boo, 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 showing up every, like, 38 seconds. Oh my god, yeah, I was just like, oh, I... Yeah, it's like, it's so, it's very... It's, it's like, those parts, like, just... and then, like, the last five minutes of the movie really, really leans into it. Oh, like, I wanted to put an ice break, ice fucking pig in my brain. It's like, like, Timmy C starts singing a whole new rendition of Pure Imagination, and he's like, Oh, I will now build my factory. Come with me, um, Hugh, Hugh Grant Oopa Loompa. And, and, and so, like, okay, oh yeah, that's right, this is a... So it's, and again, it's one of those things, like, you do your own thing or you don't, mm -hmm. you know? It's, I feel like that if it had just completely been a new incarnation a new vision of it then like i could at least give it like that i don't know what, what's the word i'm looking for that credit but it's like oh it's, you're still you're still holding on you gotta mm -hmm. let go it's been it's been 50 years it's been 50 holy shit it's been 50 years Jesus. it's been 50 years warner brothers it's time to let go just let it die. Kill it if you have to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say like, you know, while the singing was, again, like I'll let you be a judge, like, cause I have a tent ear. I'm just like, oh, there's music now. La 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 la. That's that's the extent of my critical prowess when it comes to musicals. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm just it. a dipshit. <laughs> no, it's, I just have, I don't know. Um, but in terms of like what he was doing with you, I think he actually did all right with the role. Like, at least I could see him. I could see him doing like more lighthearted roles in the future because most of what he's known for is kind of like the more brooding, like Paul Atreides kind of thing. <laughs> sure, I, I, he's fun in Lady Bird as the kind of like hipster douche or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, 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 di I didn't like him. Oh, no. He's like, there's just like nothing behind his eyes. I like, at one point I leaned over to my friend and I started whispering like Quint's like fucking Indianapolis speech from Jaws. It's cause like, they were like, he was like glassy eyed the whole time. I just, I couldn't, <laughs> it felt like he was like aware. He was like, he, I don't know. He felt self-conscious about like the whimsical bullshit he was spouting. Maybe I was just too jaded by then, but I couldn't do it. Yeah, like, and to be sure, like, he, it's not like, I wasn't somewhere where I was like, whoa, he's like totally melted. I was always kind of like, okay, this is still 
to me. Oh, see sure. And as... let me be. Let me be absolutely clear. Like I want, whim I love whimsy and, and silly yeah. stuff and fun. Like I don't look down my nose at that. I'm just like I feel that when the movie is jerking me around, that's when I sort of, you know, bristle. Yeah. And yeah, I don't, I'll say I've, I know kind of how you feel. It's like do you, um, I think it was like like early 2020. This was like right before everything went down. Um. There was a movie came out called Doolittle, which had, oh which, was, which was trying to go for that kind of like that whimsical feel to it. And it was, oh my God. Now that was some manufactured whimsy. I can tell you that much. Mm -hmm. That was like, it's like this. I'm just kind of like, oh, this like, it's better than Doolittle. It's better than, oh, would you say it's better than the 2005 Charlie, Charlie no he, yes this one like <laughs> yes not even close <laughs> so th there we go there we go it has at least that going for it um and again like because and like on its own thing it's like you can judge it like that but also when it comes down to it i don't know if i could see this willy wonka turning into the guy who's going to build a giant tunnel just to scare the shit out of kids and their family. <laughs> really? You got that from this? No, I'm saying I didn't. I okay. didn't get Sorry, that. I... I was like, okay. You know, it's like, I. that'll be in Wonka too. That's going to oh, be God. the one that's directed by Todd Phillips. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fully a oop. Oh, no. The, the cinematic, the, they're going to converge. God. Because um, I think that was like a big thing, and maybe it's jumping forward, but like at the end of this film, I cannot tell you, because in, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or Willy, whichever is the correct one, he is a reclusive, uber capitalist, child hating man. And I cannot tell you how he's remotely on that trajectory at the end of this film. Yeah, it's like, it, he's like, oh. <laughs> Chocolate, you know, the secret of chocolate is the friends you share it with. And it's like, you know, what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the like 20 years is going to completely like shatter that world view. Yeah. He has really good Oompa Loompa relations too. <laughs> uh, speaking of Oompa Loompas, um, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you want to talk about the hue in the room? <laughs> So this was a part of the trailer where I saw it as like, oh no, this, and luckily it's uh, Hugh Grant as Oompa Loompa isn't in the movie too much because whenever it is, I'm just like, oh, oh, this just this, this <laughs> feels like it doesn't fit. Even though this is literally a movie called Wonka, the Oompa Loompa does not fit here. <laughs> oh, he didn't need to be in the movie. But I, oddly enough, I identified him with him very much because he wanted to be in this film as much as I did. So, <laughs> I think Respect. he's even said that he said that in interviews too. Hugh Grant is like he did not like being in this role. Him and Ridley Scott are just trying to like inflame people more than the other. And it's just it's. Because it's like, oh, it's a Willy Wonka movie, and Willy Wonka has Oompa Loompas, so the Oompa Loompas need to be in the movie. And it's just they like, didn't it's... didn't have to be. And that's exactly it. It's like, by bringing... I hate to call Willy Wonka a fucking brand, but when you bring the Willy Wonka brand into the movie, and it messes with the core of the story that could potentially work. Like, if this was just a, a knockoff Willy Wonka where it's just like, oh, it's a story about chocolatiers and whatnot and finding your dreams. Like, you shave off so much of that baggage. Mm hmm And I feel like the movie would have been stronger for that. That could have been uh, interesting. Um, to kind of swing back to being like positive again, a couple of just like small things or just like the the design of this movie had a lot of stuff that kind of impressed me. There's like like when he when Willy Wonka opens his chocolate shop, there's like this big set. I was like, that's it's a cool looking set. Yeah, um, with the like the tree and the kind of like that was pretty sweet. I like that a lot. Yeah. 
<laughs> sweet. <laughs> uh, um. yeah, it's, like, it's, it's like either that's a real set or the visual effects artist did a really good job on that. No, that um, looks really good. Um, really good. And then he also has like this briefcase thing that like unfolds into like a chocolate making station. And I think that's a real prop. It looks pretty cool. I love like contraptions like that. Yeah, it's like, like if you just put like a contraption in a movie, I'm really like, I want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it does kind like, of try to like give you like oh here's the sort of like magic that's infused into his chocolate and it's something that's more which is something that like i know it's not your ally i do want to touch on very briefly is the chocolate's drugs right <laughs> Like, they're, like, especially the Keegan-Michael Key character is, like, like, I was I was waiting for the scene when he'd have, like, a little, like, smudge of chocolate under his nose or something. Because they were, like, really leaning into that, like, this one's for the parents. But then, like, okay, if that's our metaphor and they're a cartel and it's very sort of, like, Bogus Bunsen Beanie or whatever with, like, the relationship to the, the church, which is one of my more favorite elements to it because it did feel a little bit more kind of like that roll doll like resentment for authority figures but um okay if they're all selling like cocaine or heroin or whatever like so ostensibly Willy Wonka's making fentanyl like what <laughs> like he's making a more potent version of this highly addictive substance like I don't know what's going on Let's strengthen like your shrooms act. Yeah. Crazy. Absolutely kind of, insane. Kind of five milligrams of that sweet, sweet white. I'm just saying like, like breaking bad style. Just like we make a good quality around here. <laughs> what if just the Hupa Loompa was just constantly saying bitch for no reason. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like it's 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 a lot to unpack a lot that i didn't um, know would be thrust upon me i actually i, I also really um agree with your thing with like the aspect like the church and everything like rowan atkinson playing like this corrupt archduke or whatever <laughs> wait archduke not archdeacon archdeacon <laughs> um i don't know why my my mind went to World Wars for a moment there, but yeah, so he's playing like this Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> um, and there's like these like chocoholic monks who like guard the entrance, and it's like that was like a fun gag. I liked that. That was one of my favorite things to do is like before I've seen a movie, like if you skim through like the soundtrack, just track listing, and you try to guess what the movie's going to be about based only on that. And there's a track in this score. Let me just pull it up really quickly to make sure called 500 monks one giraffe and i went oh no <laughs> yeah i was just like there's like, and honestly there's one thing i'll give the songs is that there's this um um where like the evil chocolate cartel is like trying to bribe the officer and they keep like upping their deal and the song ends there's like where you guys like they, you know, keep your stupid chocolates. 1800 boxes. Oh, deal. And like that, that got a laugh in the theater. Like there's a, a there's a few gags in here that are like that, that landed for me. Yeah, that, um, that was maybe the closest to like a clever song the movie got for me. That was kind of fun. And, and to kind of further underline how much of a, there's dozens of us, but um, the reception at the Cinerama was very warm, and either everyone was high on their chocolate popcorn, or it was because they were enjoying it, so. Yeah, yeah Willy Wonka made that chocolate popcorn himself. He made yeah, sure he to make it extra strength. <laughs> extra giraffe milk. Uh, um, hey, to kind of swing back towards um, um, Kind of lambasting this movie a little bit. The ending gets a little out of hand. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, like this is the kind of thing where 
my general kind of rule when it comes to kind of continuity stuff is that if I don't notice it in the middle of the movie, then it's like, okay, the story's strong enough to kind of keep me going. But when I start noticing stuff as I'm just watching the story, then I'm like, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, And... So, so they try to break into this underground vault where the cartel has like a record of the evil doings and going to be like, oh, they'll expose it to the world and stop them. But then the, the bad guys confront them, trap them inside. And so it's like, it's kind of like this like final act. Like he's like, you're going to go into the chocolate reservoir. We're going to fill it up. We're going to drown you in our chocolate. Um, do you have any last words? And Willy Wonka's like, oh, can you give this jar to uh, Hugh Loompa. Um, because like, the reason that uh, Hugh Grant Loompa is following him is he's like, oh, you stole our cocoa beans, so I'm going to take the chocolate that you make to repay the debt that you And let's be clear, Loompa he stole beans. five cocoa beans. <laughs> he went all the way to Loompa Land for five cocoa beans. <laughs> Like, was, was that, like, some kind of, like, secret and grainly needs for his chocolate? Like, like specifically from there? He's probably used that up already. <laughs> you know, he's gone. That's gone. Um, but so, and so, he's like, I'll give this jar to the Oompa Loompa. And the cartel take it. And I was like, oh, he just did, like, a clever thing where, like, he knows that they're not, that they're evil. They're not going to give it to the Oompa Loompa. The Oompa Loompa will wreak vengeance on them and then save mm -hmm. willy to because it's like you still owe me a debt um but then that's not what he's doing at all because <laughs> he's like oh um because you know they're getting to like something and he's just like oh i don't know what we're gonna do there's nothing we can do goodbye noodle yeah it was like wait are you okay it's just he's always kind of got a plan but not it's, this time, I guess. It's so weird, because it's like, did did he really expect the bad guys to give over the chocolate then? <laughs> and this, this is what I'm talking about with, like... Because, like, if he had well, done that, kind of like... Oh, go ahead. If he No, but I'm just, like, like you're saying, if he gives them the, him the chocolate, Hoompa Loompa just leaves, and they die anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's so... It's so... It, again, it's one of those things where, where I don't see this Willy Wonka becoming the Willy Wonka that we know from books from Gene Wilder. Um, and like that, uh, again, I don't think that would have like shifted the needle all the way, but it would have been a little closer. Like, okay, he can be a little clever. He can set yeah, a little he can trap be here. Crafty, you know? and, yeah. Yeah, it's like it could be like a little bit closer, but now it's just like, oh no. Oh, I wanted to do a nice thing with my last swish, and now I am ready to die. <laughs> it's almost, like, in a way, like, a, a variation on, like, how, like, all these Disney villains of the latest three or four years, like, can't be villains. It's kind of like that. Like, we can't have any subversion in our story. Or not even subversion, but, you know, just kind of, like, unpleasantness. Or <laughs> I don't know. We yeah, do get that like, with the Olivia Coleman character, of course, but like from the your central characters can't have any layers like that. Yeah, as it can't be like crafty or cunning, you know, it's got to be precious, wholesome bean. Mm -hmm. and it's like, like it, this is Willy Wonka. Like this, mo like that 1971 movie, it terrorized me as a child <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> at several points. It's not just like the ones that everyone like knows are scary and messed up, but I still kept coming back to it because like it, it would scare me, but I would love the I would still really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I just had to leave the room as a boy is getting sucked <laughs> into a pipe. <laughs> it's an acceptable level of trauma. Yeah. Yeah, like, also, like like Slughorn in that movie is like he was freaky dude like i think that was just kind of like you know your little kid who taught stranger danger and then like charlie like runs into scary stranger like oh no ah. mm -hmm. or maybe just that like, was just oh. me because i was a very timid 
Um, and we're just talking about like the. But yeah, so, so like it, the ending where I'm just like. If they missed this really great opportunity to have like this really interesting character moment for him, right? Maybe it could be like, oh, like he's finally learned to be a little cunning in this world that's so cutthroat. Mm hmm. That we, we, we don't get that. He gets some like grit along the way or something. Yeah, it's like he kind of, I don't know, he can at least like gesture towards him becoming a little bit more cynical. Yeah, you have to, like, this is a prime opportunity for him to realize, or, like, learn lessons, bad lessons, but A, you need money to get ahead, and B, no one's gonna, like, look out for you or whatever, something, I don't know, but yeah, it's like, not even if he's fully, it doesn't have to be, you know, taxi driver, but, like, yeah. you know. Just, like, a little, you can say, like, and, and again, it's... Yeah, you know, to get back to your point, where it's like, oh, like you can't have things be too scary. And it's like, there's a reason these this was popular in the first place. Like, if people mm -hmm. didn't want, you know, like if, you know, Willy Wonka, that was like, you know, cynical or anything, then they would mm -hmm. not like the 1971 version as much as they do. Exactly. You know, or it's like, you know, to kind of like tangent here, it's like Disney made that Artemis Fowl movie. Like, oh, we can't have him be an evil boy genius he has to be like a nice wholesome boy and it's like the books were best sellers people liked it people spent money on it why would you get the rights to do this thing and then not do it right just kind of like cut it off at the knees and like remove the element that kind of made it special right it's <sighs> um let's still with that like i don't know that little albert thing it's still like again it has parts where like it could have been stronger and yes it feels more like a paul king story than a rolled doll adaptation it doesn't quite j those elements don't always mix together well but overall i'd still say that i i at least I had an agreeable, pleasant time with the movie myself. That's great. Yes. And you had your chocolate popcorn. I had my chocolate popcorn. <laughs> to, to tide you over. It's, um, any other thoughts on this one? Um, oh, one random, like, I I noticed that um, the cinematographer is uh, Chung Hoon Chung, who's, he did, like, The Handmaiden, which is a really phenomenal film, so he's got a wild filmography um <laughs> but i i desperately desperately need to know when he f comes to town and he gives out those hover chocks and everyone starts floating does that man say bussy and if so can i remove that from every single working print of this movie I think actually what needs to happen is they need to remix the audio to make that louder. Like when you put the waveform into like a video editor, it'll just be like halfway through it. And then just that one moment, just be a giant spike. Just, just like completely <laughs> fry it, which looking back at my recording here, like, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Well, we'll Pascal will fix it. Pa Pascal will fix it in the post. It'll fix it in the post. That's what all movie scream. studio. It's <laughs> just. Yeah, that's. You've just earned an executive producer credit on Wonka. Yes. So, you know, why don't we, why don't we talk about, um, let me take a break and talk about... Journey into a world of whimsy and magic with Godzilla minus one. Koichi Shikashima moves to the big city to become a chocolatier, but uh-oh, things aren't quite what he expects. He has to pull together with a group of scrappy misfits to face down Godzilla, who wants to stomp out his little dreams. Oh no! Can the little guys win out in the end? Will the little orphan girl find her family? And is it true that the real secret ingredient is the friends we made along the way? Take the kids and sing along with the feel-good event of the holiday season. <laughs> now this... This was a good fucking movie. <laughs> this is a movie <laughs> that oh is shockingly God. similar to Wonka <laughs> in more ways than I expected. Like, like, I kind of proposed this double feature as like a gag, but I was 
I was putting my points together. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a second. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, But oh yeah, this was actually super phenomenal. Because I, I haven't really heard about it. It's like, most of it, I was like, oh, there's there's a new Godzilla movie being made. And then my friend, um, uh, my friend Buster, um, we were in a Discord server together. Um, they saw it and they were raving on it. They loved it so much. Um, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll check this out. And oh my god. <laughs> no, it's like, I remember like being aware that a trailer had been released. And like, I don't even think I watched the trailer. Um, and then, you know, being aware that it like came out. So it's like, fuck it, I'll just, I'll check it out. I have nothing better to do this afternoon. And like, this is the most I've cried during a Godzilla movie. And it might be my favorite one. <laughs> Honestly, it's so amazing how, because like you know, this whole line of Godzilla movies we've seen from like from state sides, um, was it Warner Brothers that, that does this franchise as well? Uh, um, yeah, it's like Warner Brothers and Dimension or something. Yeah, and it's like like it's all of a sudden people are like, oh, who cares if the human stories are bad? You don't watch it for the human stories. And then Godzilla minus one comes out, and it's like I do watch this shit for the human stories. <laughs> No, like the the dimension monster verse are like basically like late Showa era Godzilla where he's it's absolute schlock. And like this movie is basically what um like legacy sequels or whatever. This is like kind of a reboot or a parallel boot or whatever like this is what they should aspire to be and it's maybe like the best like spielberg and like blockbuster that's come out in a while yeah it's just like an like of all these like big i think that that's like the best way to describe this i'm just like it's a blockbuster movie because it has the heart to it the excitement oh my god it just hits so many amazing notes um so to kind of like, we'll kind of get into it here. And again, we're just going to spoil the whole thing just because that's what we do here. We just jump right in. Um, so again, this follows this uh, young man, Shikishima, who in the last days of World War II, he's a kamikaze pilot uh, and he fakes engine trouble to land on an island base because he can't bring himself to complete his mission, um, his suicide kamikaze mission. And his superior officer is kind of like clearly on those ruse. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, we looked at that plane. Everything seems to be in order. Hmm. <laughs> um, and another man on the island, you know, kind of comes to talk to him. And it's like, he understands. He's like, the war is lost already. Like, they're, you know, you killing yourself with the plane isn't going to move the needle at all. Mm hmm. Um,. And then that night, Godzilla Oops. attacks the island. And um, everything goes fine. Every, everything is totally fine. The, uh, you know, this, you know, most of the garrison isn't killed. And Chikishima isn't, you know, traumatized by the fact that he found himself unable to pull the trigger against the monster. You know, it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. it's, everything's okay. And this kind of sets in motion his whole character arc you know he he's failed his like you know quote unquote honor as far as fulfilling his duties as a kamikaze pilot he has you know would anything have happened if he had been able to fire on Godzilla who knows but he fails again at this and then he comes home and there's this just pall of of shame that hangs over him because his neighbor knows what he did you know and and he also has this unprocessed trauma that he can't really talk to anyone about exactly you know he gets home and like the neighborhood is in ruins like parents are dead, like like neighbors are dead um and it's like the american firebombing is like destroyed all these residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's just like every episode now of this podcast. Like, yeah, this is just going to exclusively be. <laughs> it's like everything has to call back now to that one. This one. <laughs> but, um, 
But in the midst of this devastation, he finds a woman who is like trying to like steal to survive and everything. And she has this baby that's not even her baby, but it's like baby was orphaned. She took it in. Um, Shikishima takes a pair of them in. And it's just it's like, oh, this is just like a temporary living arrangement. But as time goes on, things start to settle a bit. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I li- like so much about this movie is that it has this really great marriage of both this, the personal, the psychological storytelling, this personal narrative that's going on, and also the social storytelling where you see Japan as a whole starting to kind of rebuild and move on after the war. And these parallels here are just very... I really love the way that it's established like the the way the backgrounds change, the way that the neighborhood cleans up between scenes, you know, like mm-hmm. the ruined house is repaired. Um, yeah, you get the, and, the sense of the passage of time, the sense of this sort of like development of their relationship, just all in this very like clean, economical sort of montage, essentially. Yeah. Like Noriko, the woman that, um, you know, he, he took and like, she goes from being like, oh, covered in like, and, like rags and everything to like, she gets a job at another city. She mm-hmm. has like this nice new outfit, all like crisp and clean. And it's just interesting to kind of see how things, you know, are kind of healing back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, oh, and then, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just kind of, I was just pushing things forward. Yeah. So Shikishima, he gets this job. Um, he is clearing out mines with like a little team. There's like, there's like someone they call you know, Doc. Um, there's a, a young man who didn't go to war. He's like, oh man, I wish I had a chance to do it, which Shikishima does not take kindly to. <laughs> um, yeah, there's also this other guy who's like kind of like this anti-authority guy. He's like, I don't like to take orders. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like all these like very unique personalities are trying to clear out the minds. But then guess who comes back into the picture? Uh Oh, our favorite lizard. Yes. This who... was like the a, a really good, like communication of like the Godzilla, like, I don't know mythos or something because like the first attack on the island um before the war ends is really like visceral and frightening um but when i was watching it's it like godzilla seems like a little small and a little like kind of dinky and like but like then we communicate you see like the detonation of the nuclear test at the beginning at all and like so he gets like mutated by this atomic testing and when he comes back he's like not to be fucked with um so that's kind of an interesting way to like communicate that i think this story is really good at like giving you information in like a non-verbal way or whatnot and it's also a really interesting way of kind of like starting to get at like some of the themes that it's going to be kind of dealing with um in this case like shikajima's job is like essentially like cleaning up the detritus of the war it's a risky job, and it, but it's something that has to be done, you know, if you want to have safe, like, shipping lanes and stuff. And then Godzilla's, like, enhancement or whatever is also a direct result of the United States, like, further sort of, you know, Cold War activities that are coming down to affect Japan in a way. Right, and... That also kind of um, holds back on the U.S. being able to, like, intervene. I I wouldn't even say being able. Just like, oh, you know, things are already kind of tense between us and Soviet Union. We don't want to deal with, like, causing another crisis. So just like, you you guys figure this out. We're we're not going to deal with this. Um, Somebody (laughs) asked me, I saw this movie, like, is it true that, like, Douglas MacArthur is a character in the movie? (laughs) And it's like, like, like through archival footage, I guess, but he's not like a character character. He's got a cameo. <laughs> he's got a cameo to say, sorry, guys, you're on your own. <laughs> uh, 
I think it's so funny that people are calling this like an apolitical movie. No, this is like like, not at all. This is just (laughs) as politically charged as the first one. Yes. And I just, I really like that because like this really gets back to, um, well, I guess I will kind of talk about the the differences a Mm -hmm. little bit later once, um, once we kind of build out more like what this movie's doing. Um, yeah, so... Japan is like, like, oh god, what, what, what do we do? This giant monster's coming at us. Um, like, they send, like, um, Shikishima's, like, team. They have, like, these little itty-bitty wooden boats. They're like the boats from Jaws, except no, smaller, it, I think. <laughs> I was getting really strong, like, Jaws vibes throughout the whole thing. Just the way that it shoots everything, the vulnerability. The boat really gets emphasized, and then kind of Godzilla is... Uh, not like he's mostly kind of like this unseen presence in a lot of it, especially during these stretches. Yeah, it's like it's a very yeah, yeah. It's like it's again, it just captures that quintessential like that the emotional base are just like oh my god, these folks are on this like this little dinky teeny tiny boat and they're facing off against literal Godzilla and you're like oh my god oh my god like there's a part where um like Godzilla's like swimming after them they're trying to like they pretty much they don't have any like real weapons the government's just like oh, it's a, the, the mines you're you're grabbing from the water just just use them just use them <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like they're trying to like desperately throw these mines overboard to try to like stop Godzilla <laughs> Godzilla's just like, oh, I have healing factor now. Sorry. Yeah, it's like they only survive because like uh, the United Nations is like, oh, we'll send, we'll let you have one of your warships back. Like we took all your stuff. Like we'll have, they have like one warship back to try to deal with that. And then he just like fucking like nukes it. <laughs> yeah, like oops. I really liked the effect of like the nuclear, like the atomic breath in this, because like in. Because, like, you know, he eventually makes landfall, and again, you look at, like, the monsterverse kind of stuff, or, like, you look at, like, the other ways that Godzilla has kind of played out since the original, where it's, like, oh, he's, like, like a fun character, so it's, like, oh, he's using his powers, all oh, here it goes, blah, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But here it does a great job of taking this thing that's, like, almost, like, I, I'll feel like a fan service element, honestly, in some of the Godzilla movies, where it's, like, oh... You gotta charge up the power and then use the power mm-hmm. but it did a great job of making it feel so visceral and terrifying again no it was i was gobsmacked like it really like you get the little charge of you're like oh shit it's happening and then it's just like the like the level of like detail that they decided to portray this with and just the the like the reality of it like you get like this mushroom cloud that builds and the shock wave and the black rain that falls on shigashima as he just can't process what he's seeing oh my god like when that like the black rain started falling that just like because everything in that moment is like this like powerful powerful scene because unleash it and then it's like guys are like roaring and like the mushroom cloud is like rising up above him and it's like the music swells mm-hmm. so you just starts like screaming and then the black ring and that just like my heart just like shattered i was like no. holy shit i just oh. gasped i was just like oh my god it's a very again just like this movie is able to use this real this imagery a lot of it from like real life Mm-hmm. And just put in this way that's just perfectly able to evoke what I imagine it's trying to evoke. Right. You know? Just these, um... Oh. Well, it's interesting because, like, we were saying with Wonka, like, they kind of, like, go a different direction. Like, they don't solo a Star Wars story. It, like, you must be walked out, so you're going to be called Wonka or something. Like, um, that wasn't sweaty enough. Yeah. Uh but like that one you know kind of just decides to go in its own direction like a a rhyming path or something parallel and this one takes like fan service and like kind of weaponizes it like um this atomic breath display it's like you that's like the first time you get like the completion of like 
the whole Godzilla roar, which is really fucking a cool sound design. But it's like immediately after Shikishima has apparently lost his partner, like she gets kind of blown away in the in the shockwave. And then earlier, it takes it a little further, even like when he like is attacking Ginza. And then you get the shot where he like grabs the train and like that's like shot for shot i remember from the original like that's just something that's kind of in the cultural like <laughs> collective unconscious or whatever but like it's not just an image like oh remember the thing it's like well noriko is like on that train and so we're connected to it in the moment from like a storytelling perspective not just so like oh i've seen that before remember the thing you know like you just throughout this whole thing it takes these godzilla is a really like iconic character but like it it has something more to do with that and kind of it ties it in with the legacy and it ties in with like what that original film was about and that makes it more interesting yeah and i feel like to kind of come back to what i had started earlier with um talking about like the themes of it mm -hmm. because at this point we're like Shikishima has like lost he thinks he's lost Noriko and everyone was always like dude like you're not marrying her like you've lived with her for like two years now two three years now you're basically raising a kid together like this is your family it's time to like mm -hmm. make that official and he's like no oh, I, I I can't it's, um and now he's like I won't be able to do that I have to stop Godzilla and everyone else is like, well, what are we going to do? And this is where the movie like goes from like being great to like really, really amazing for me. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is Doc from the boat, he was like, he had been like, oh, like I designed things, you know, during the war. And he leads this whole presentation where a lot of like former sailors come in and like, okay, we basically, we don't have a military, um, and the government isn't going to help us. The U.S. isn't going to help us. Um, we don't have any arms or anything. We are going to have to come together as private citizens to try to fix this. And in one of the meetings, he says something that just struck me so powerfully. Where he goes on about, like, you know, the... You know, for too long, we haven't valued human life. During the war, like, we didn't arm our tanks, we didn't install ejector seats in our airplanes, we did not value human life. And this plan that I have created, which involves trying to, like, sink Godzilla using gas canisters and then rapidly bring him back up to try to, like, use the ocean mm -hmm. pressure to kill him. He says, in this plan, Nobody is going to sacrifice themselves. Nobody is going to die a hero. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to live through this plan. And we can see this over the, through some of the other characters, like the neighbor who had originally shamed Shikishima for being like, you're a kamikaze pilot. Why are you here alive? You know, all of this is your fault to over the course of the story, becoming friendlier, helping to take care of the baby and by the end of the movie she says like you know she chastises him for ever considering <coughs> no, sorry something in my throat <laughs> chastises him for ever considering leaving his like sacrificing himself yeah she's like the best aunt by the end of it and because you look at the 1954 godzilla and that was very specifically about the atom bomb, I think. The fear of the weapons arms race. Because Godzilla is created by an atomic explosion. And he's defeated by this new weapon called the Oxygen Destroyer. Which is created by the scientist who's like, This thing is so powerful, it's even worse than an atom bomb. I'm going to sacrifice myself, I've destroyed all my plans for it, so that way it will not be able to be replicated because I don't want to contribute to an ongoing arms race. Mm -hmm. Whereas this movie feels this reboot, which takes place similar time immediately after World War II, 
feels like a bit more of like a national reckoning where it's not just the atom bomb, it's the spiritual sickness that had permeated through Japanese society that made that, that propelled them to war in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um kind of being slowly recognized and treated. They take their bravery, they take their ingenuity, and instead of creating weapons of war, they create positive ways to protect themselves that don't involve guns, that don't involve the military bravado or anything like that. And they do it in a way that values human life, that d doesn't view life as something disposable to be thrown away for an outcome. Yeah, it's it's a reckoning with the kind of the civilian tolls of the war machine and how can we kind of move forward and heal collectively. Yeah. And it's like, it's definitely, because when it comes down to it like that, it's still a controversial topic in Japan. You know, you look at like, you know, in Germany, there was that very definite reckoning. There's a the Nuremberg yes. trials, you know, it's a very... You know, there, there was that moment like, okay, we have fucked up, we have apologized, and we are going to do whatever we can to not let that ever happen again. Mm -hmm. In Japan, there was never that same kind of reckoning. There's still, there's still tensions, there's still things that feel unresolved, there's still things that the government has never outright said, yes, that was a bad thing. You know, we're going to express, at least express an apology for it. So that is right. still, that is still a sore topic. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like this is a movie that, that, that probably could not have been made in 1954. And I think revisiting this scenario, revisiting, revisiting Godzilla with this new perspective, I think is a very powerful thing to see. Yeah, I think, you know, that's what really makes it effective. It's like, it's returning to the tone and the, like, intent of the original, but it's kind of taking another pass at the basic story. It is, um, but, like, what is the current dialogue or what can we kind of say or postulate or, or try, to, try to deal with, um you know and then also more like superficial elements like making the mechanism of killing Godzilla a little bit more kind of grounded and whatnot which is I don't think this movie could from a like a movie language perspective go like full B movie like Godzilla 1954 could do but this can definitely talk about kind of the state of things and in a way that Ishiro Honda probably couldn't or maybe wouldn't want to right yeah, because again, that that was released what only not not even a decade after the end of the war. Yeah, like, no, that was still fresh. Yeah, yeah. like it was I don't remember if the occupation might have even still been ongoing. I don't remember the timeline. Yeah. Um, because definitely this movie, because like while it isn't like the main focus of this movie, it does kind of take a swipe at like oh the U.S. just like it, it made this problem and now it doesn't mm -hmm. really want to deal with it. Exactly. Um, um, I don't think MacArthur would have been happy to have seen that in the fifties. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also just like like a, a uh, like a short thing here, because um, mm -hmm. I was kind of doing some stuff, and apparently the the name of protagonist Shikishima means scattered islands. And oh, okay. apparently, it's interesting. It's supposed to be like a poetic name for Japan, is what I mm -hmm. heard. And so it's kind of interesting. It's like, again, it adds to that whole kind of social aspect of it, where it's like your character is literally Japan. <laughs> no, and he's kind of like a microcosm of this whole process of like, he's, his most important thing is self-forgiveness in a way is like, I deserve to live and I deserve to have a fulfilling life and stuff and I suppose yes. in a way that's happening on a larger scale. Yeah, as I get some, you know, you know, different layers to it, so that is just a really, 
really appreciate. Um, one thing I'll definitely say is like, um, so at the the climax of the movie, where um, because they're describing the plan with like the gas canisters, like, but we don't know for certain if it's going to work because we've never seen Godzilla before. We don't know like the biology or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just like something that should kill any creature that we currently know exists. And <laughs> Chikishima's was like, oh, just in case he he's like, oh, I'm gonna get a plane to like he uses as a decoy, but it's a front for him to like load it with explosives and then fly it into Godzilla's mouth. He's like, oh, it's vulnerable on the inside. If I do that, then we have like a hail mary in case the the doc's plan doesn't work mm -hmm. and there's this great setup where because like you said doc has that line where it's like oh we don't we didn't install ejector seats into the planes and shikishima he gets a mechanic who was on the island one of the only other survivors and he's like help me set up this plane only you would understand why i need to like complete this suicide mission and the mechanic, who at first was, like, livid at Shikishima mm -hmm. for not uh, saving anyone, has come to, like, forgive him. So, he, as he's working on the plane, we see him kind of, like, look at the cockpit. And then the rest of the movie goes. And she, and then, you know, again, for kind of, like, payoff, it's like, oh, the doc's plane doesn't work. Godzilla's still alive. So, Shikishima takes his plane, flies it right in, and explodes... Godzilla's head just explodes and he sinks in. At first it's like, oh no, he died. And then it's like, no, wait, look, he's got a, he's there in a parachute. Mm -hmm. And it was this, and then it's this great moment where it's like, yes, because I could kind of, as like, it's this great moment where it shows that if you are, if you can tell what happens in a movie, it can still be super satisfying when it does that little maneuver there. Yeah. Because I was like, no, because oh you see him take like he he has words with Shikishima like before he goes out on the mission. You're like, okay, I I have an inkling of where that's going. But even if you know where it's going, it's more about the delivery. Exactly, because like because when it was like, look, there he is. I just I literally put my arms in there. I was like, yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> I, was, I was like, yes, this is so good. No, that was just the most goddamn satisfying like action sequence just the way it was paced out the like you know exactly the beats that it's supposed to like the stages the plan and you're seeing it and it's just like it's perfectly calibrated to keep you like really tense you're watching like the encircle godzilla with their little like uh Freon was it freon or something i forget um i think so yeah his like... little like hula hoop <laughs> <laughs> belt of <laughs> pressurization you know and then like uh, it again kind of evokes Godzilla or not Godzilla it evokes Godzilla Jesus Christ it evokes Jaws <laughs> um, when like you just see his little like pontoon hula hoop like float to the surface but you can't see Godzilla and you're like oh fuck what's going on it's like the um, those barrels that they were chucking at the shark and it's just so like you know, and when the like the original Godzilla theme like kicks in, it just fucking goes so hard. It's like just distilled excitement, and it's very satisfying. Oh my God, yeah, it's like that's a great way to use like the legacy music because it's like, because first of all, that's just a that's just it a just great slaps. Song. Yeah, and also it's used in a point. It's, that it feels fitting and you're like oh yeah the music's coming they're gonna take him down <laughs> yeah it earned it yeah where it's like it, it's not just like randomly they don't start playing the godzilla theme as shikishima is talking about like his trauma <laughs> or something that would be um, wild no it's just like i when i was leaving the theater i was super jazzed and there was this like fucking wet blanket like Roger Ebert wannabe out of like ahead of me like loudly exclaiming to his seat partner like how he didn't like tropes and it was like but that's what makes these so satisfying it's like it's these very simple like characters and stuff but you're you it's so that you can kind of like 
quickly pass over some unimportant information and then dig into the more interesting stuff be it like exciting action sequences or whatnot or interesting kind of thematic commentary and whatnot like i don't care that like you immediately know that um the floppy haired guy is like the mad scientist and he's gaff prone and stuff it's like okay i got that information cool i know who he is or whatever and honestly like fuck george clooney these are my boys in the boat i <laughs> love them all they're so adorable i was so invested it's the real boys in the boat these are the real boys in the boat <laughs> yeah like it and that's the thing is like because yeah, there's a point where, like, tropes can get kind of, like, tiring, especially, like, if they're leaned on, like, a crutch. But in a movie like this, where it's put in the work, it's put in the legwork to be emotionally investing. And I like, it's the perfect example of where it's like, oh my gosh, they're going to do the thing, now they're going to do the thing. And it happens and you feel satisfied because that expectation was met. Mm-hmm. It's like, I think if you thought critically about it, you're like, okay, there's no real eventuality in this movie, even with how dark it's gotten, that Shikishima, like, doesn't come through somehow. But even if you know that, and, like, you're, you're you know, at the back of your head, that doesn't make the way that it delivers that twist, if you will, like, less satisfying. Exactly. You know, it's, it's executed super well. It's... I'm still so invested in it. And, you know, I'll even say, because I've seen, like, one thing that's a bit more controversial is that is after everybody comes back, like, oh, we did it, we defeated Godzilla. Um, He's handed this telegram where it turns out that Noriko is still alive. Like, she survived and she's in a hospital. Mm-hmm. And I saw some people like, oh, that cheapens like her sacrifice earlier in the movie but i would i would disagree with that now like give him the w let him let him have it we get yeah, our happy ending at the end of it yeah and i feel like the reason the way that works for me is that he again he had been kind of dragging his feet on making this family official you know because he's like and you can kind of tell like she wants to make things official but he's always like no it's, mm -hmm. it's not for me no it's not gonna happen and he, and he kind of gets some inklings right before the city attack where like he maybe he's starting to warm up to the idea of it being a family but then she she gets blasted basically by Godzilla <laughs> <laughs> like it's like, like I was like oh shit oh my god yeah that was uh, and she like saves him basically yeah, like, like she, kind of pushes him out of the way yeah shows him to an alley so that's um that he can be safe and in that moment it's kind of like like a punishment like he took so long like getting to the point with her that now he's mm -hmm. not gonna have that chance and but o over the course of the movie then he as he learns and the value of his own life the idea of like you know it can be easy to sacrifice your life for some greater good it's harder to fight come back alive for the people who depend on you mm -hmm. and once yeah, just... you learn oh go ahead no i'm just saying it's a really powerful through line that plays out through him if he's representing japan but also just you see that in different facets from all these different people exactly and it's only after he learns that lesson that the story then says you get a second chance with norco mm -hmm. and that's why that still works for me Um, yeah, it's just like, just like from beginning to end, it's like, I feel like a lot of this has just been us talking about what happens in the movie, but it's, it's just like, yeah, it's, the, the, the movie's just really good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a treat. Yeah, it's like, it's got like a lot of interesting stuff going on. It's like, cause you can enjoy it like on that, like that surface level, you know, thriller, adventure, exciting blockbuster. But then if you want to just like dig in a little bit more, it has really interesting, unique stuff that it's saying. Um, yeah, like, I, and I'm... And I know a lot of the, the talk of this movie actually has been about its budget. 
Mm, mm hmm. Because, like, apparently this movie cost. The official budget is $15 million. Hmm. And the director said that actually, like, we didn't even hit that much. Like, it be under. Became an under budget even then. Mm hmm. And to be. And, you know, and there's a lot of folks that are like, oh, see, like, Hollywood. And I think an important caveat there is that Japan doesn't have, like, the working protections for actors, yeah. writers, that kind of thing that the United States has. So, yeah, like, you know, things come in, you know, it's cheaper because they don't, you know, they work people harder over there. Um, yeah, it's, there's different practices and stuff. Yeah. That's... Uh, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, it is really impressive. The other thing that I wonder is, like, uh, Takashi Yamazaki was was directed, wrote, and also did, like, headed the visual effects. So I wonder if knowing exactly what you want from the start helps to a degree. You mean, like, planning out a movie before yeah, the like, and then what? making that movie instead of I thought changing this it on the for. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's because like like because I not feel like to like still... simp overly, but like. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, because I feel like there's still something to be said. Because if you had quadrupled the pay of everyone involved, mm -hmm. that's a what like a sixty million movie, mm, and that's really... you know, and I think it's again a very powerful thing that it came in with this great story. And it's been able to really take over the, the worldwide box office because the word of mouth has been great. People are mm -hmm. seeing it. So I'm really happy to see that this has been succeeding. And I hope this sends a message that these smaller movies, again, obviously, you know, you know to make something that's like 15 million probably won't happen here in the States because, you know, you want to pay people fairly, have right. working conditions, everything. Mm -hmm. But even that, it's like, fifth, like a fifty million dollar movie with a great script can do well. Yeah, like what basically whatever this would translate into with like the American like union system or whatever and whatnot, like hundred million. I don't know what that would be. I'm you know I, but like we don't need three hundred million dollars to make Indiana Jones. In the Dial of Destiny. Right. Exactly. You know, and... Yeah, I'm just, I'm really happy that it's doing so well. It's a really, it's a really enjoyable story. It it kind of returns to the roots of the, the, the kind of the character and it's then zeitgeist, I think. You know, I think that Shin Godzilla that came out like five or six years ago is interesting because that's more of a like a fukushima allegory like kind of this government's inability to respond to a disaster whereas this one's a little bit more kind of calling back to kind of what got this whole interesting little character started and then very quickly became godzilla dancing on the moon when he beat <laughs> x monster <laughs> Yes. I mean, I love that shit too, but like, it doesn't stick with me. <laughs> yeah, like, whereas this is, this is something that I'm going to be remembering, that I'm going to be recommending for a long time. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay. Any other thoughts about Godzilla minus one? Um, I think that kind of touches on a lot of the stuff that made it interesting to me All right. yeah well hey uh thank you so much for joining me uh, again tonight reynard um this is a lovely double feature to kind of put together here yeah that's a fun chat um if you want to follow us um i'm daniel goldhorn on youtube and i'm reynard uh, slash cinema on tumblr and before we go, there's a little something that uh, Reynard actually cooked up for us to do. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Doo. 
I have a kaiju movie for you. Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Da. Godzilla's here to flatten Ginza. How can they stop him from wrecking Japan? Scientist man's got a hell of a plan. Who said these movies don't make people cry? No one got through with their eyes dry. Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Day. Gasp at this tale of post-war or war angst. Zilla's terror cannot last long. Like this Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee song. Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Da. I watched a prequel I didn't want. Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Da. Hollywood short of fresh new ideas. Who thought it wise to let Chalamet sing? I've had enough of this Hollywood twink. Chocolate is drugs and the copper is hooked. Good thing that Willie's got uncut shit cooked. Saying school kids don't do drugs. Oompa loompa doopa dee da. What a sad parody of good old roll doll. Let's just talk about Paddington too, like the Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Doo. Oh, I'm just kidding, I kinda liked it. Doopa Dee Doo!